Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Rosted. I believe this is like my sixth talk here in three years. Um, they always make me do two every time I come here. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, as most of you know, six talks, which means six selfies with my real camera. So I do this every time. Smile, everyone. Okay, got that out of the way. Uh, <clears throat> so last year, I presented something about F-Trace, and I think uh, someone in the audience here asked me a question about Kernel Shark. And they said, you know, are you working on it? Because it's been like two years since a single commit went into the repo. And Lord knows it needed commits in the repo. I said, interesting enough, we actually got someone full-time to work on it at VMware. So they've been working on it full-time, and we we're hoping to have it released soon. Uh, we're, it was supposed to be released in August, so I have a correction. It's not released. It's not released yet. Why not? Um, we have a full prototype. Uh, it works. It's great. Um, <clears throat> but the thing is, we want to make it right, because it was just a prototype. And when he started submitting me patches to review, and a lot of times I'm like, oh, this looks great, but let's, we, gotta, we want to make sure it's really good. So he did things, no, sort of a little bit, uh, some things where I, we didn't agree with, and then I was like, okay, we got to rewrite this. So it was a lot of rewriting, and then we got to a point where like, oh yeah, we can make it better this way. Oh yeah, we can make it better this way. And we got so focused on how we can make it better that we stopped progressing, and it wasn't ever getting better, or it wasn't finishing, we were just making it better before it was finished. So finally, we're like, wait a minute, it's already at the end of August, and we are way behind, because <laughs> we were having so much fun on how do we can improve the code, and how we can you know, make it more efficient, and all these things on how awesome we can make this product, that it was kind of stopped progressing to being finished. So finally, he said, okay, let's just put a bunch of to-dos in the code, saying we could work, and we could add this feature later, we could add this thing later, just let's get it out there now. It's really good, it's, you know, it's, we've already hit a high bar there, we should be able to get it out. So it's not out yet, hopefully it'll come out within, by next month. Um, so, what is Kernel Shark? So, by the way, that icon was, written, uh, was done by my daughter. Um, as like, she, she does digital animation in college and she, I, I asked her about this and she's like, oh, I, I got a couple minutes, I'll whip that up for you, so that's what she whipped up. Anyway, it's a graphical interface for trace command. What is trace command? It's a command line interface for ftrace. What is ftrace? Well, it's the official infrastructure of, or trace infrastructure of the Linux kernel. And just see any, any of my other talks. So, why update kernel shark? Well, the current version uh, of kernel shark is 0.2. Uh, it's been 0 0.2. It's actually, I think I started right, I think I wrote Kernel Shark. I created it in 2009. So Kernel Shark is nine years old and it never got past 0 0.2. It was written in GTK 2.0. And as people probably know, GTK 3.0 is up and they're not compatible. Uh, for in, so if we were going to start doing anything, we had to go to, we had to update to GTK 3.0. Um, so we had a question to do. Do I really want to go to 3.0 and then rewrite it again when GTK 4.0 comes out? <laughs> I'm like, this is where we made a decision. Let's go to Qt. Uh, Qt, I, I'm told it's called Qt. I always say Qt. Uh, back in the old day, when I worked on it, why did it go so slow? Well, I called it my idle task. Whenever I was between projects and something, I had nothing else to work on, I worked on trace command, and kernel shark after if I had, didn't have anything to work on trace command, I worked on kernel shark. So I didn't put many hours on it. I mean, I put a month of work to get it out up to one, and then since then, I think I, with like, you know, the first year, I did like a uh, month of work. After that, I probably put a month of work in for the next eight years at most. Um, but now we have, a, thanks to VMware, we have a full-time employee that does nothing but work on this, and this is awesome. <clears throat> So, why was it created? So, um, okay, so why was it created? Yeah, trace command can collect a large amount of data. Uh, I've demonstrated it before, uh, I've done lots of talks on trace command. Um, it's the interface, it gives you, it acts with the, inter, um, the tracing, you can watch scheduling events, any events, interrupts going on in the kernel, so you can see everything going on within the kernel. And uh, show you an example of some things that's always not good enough, you wanna visualize it. Uh, for example, here's a real example. 
Uh, we had this thing called cyclic tests, and I mentioned cyclic tests in my talk two days ago at Meta Recipes. And on this one machine, we got this one machine. We were working on the real-time curl. Come back, I was at Red Hat at the time. Uh, I worked as one of the lead uh, engineers of the real-time patch for Red Hat. And we had this vendor machine that we had to certify to say, hey, this is certified for the real-time kernel. And we were on a totally idle machine. Our cyclic test was hitting a 250 microsecond latency. Now, just to put this in comparison, on any other machine, on my laptop, the biggest latency it gets is about 20 microseconds. So when you're hitting 250 microseconds on a machine, it was a pretty large machine, there's something wrong with the hardware. It wasn't just like the average. It was like it would be fine, it would be like 10 microsecond latencies, and suddenly, boom, 250. Or it would actually sometimes it would jump like 50 or 100, but then it would hit 250. So we brought this up to the vendor and said, hey, you know you got this um, <clears throat> big latency, and they didn't believe us. And they said, well, run our version of cyclic tests. They, they had their own, not cyclic tests, they had a hardware latency tracer, because our hardware latency tracer, which I talked about at um, two days ago, it was detecting the 250 microsecond latency on the hardware. And they had a hardware latency tracer that detected nothing. But it was written in Java. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, I have no idea how it worked, but it never detected anything. And they said, well, no, it's not our fault. Our tips told us to do it. So we have a hardware lazy detector. And I'm like, no, it's there. So if I like, what if I do a trace? Um, but anyway, recap for those that weren't here on, on what is cyclic test. It's a tool to measure latency. You know, it's just a simple uh, go to sleep, wake up, check the time I expected to wake up, and compare it to the time that I actually did wake up. Um, Looks like this. Oh, this is the hardware latency. Uh, this is the hardware latency detector logic. I showed this from slide from Embedded Linux. I found out why their detection in Java didn't work was because look up there. What our uh, hardware latency detector does? It does this with interrupts disabled. We do two timestamps and compare the difference. But also we check the timestamp of the previous loop. So you see that last T2. Uh, so T1 minus the last T2. So we take the timestamp of the, of the current loop, compare it to the timestamp of the, the last timestamp of the previous loop, and check the outside loop to see if there's latency there. They didn't have that timestamp check in their application. They just did that T1, T2. So if uh, the latency happened outside, which, think about it, it's in Java, so 90, probably 99% of the calculations happening outside, so they have 1% of their calculation that they're checking. So they're checking 1% of the time whether or not there was a latency. That's why they never caught it. Cyclic test looks like this. Um, you know, you put an up, we, we look at the latency, the, the jitter time, the interrupt latency, wake up latency. And then trace command ran it, and we hit it. I got the latency, I got the trace in trace command. Great. I'm going to show this to the customer, to the hardware vendor, and say, see the latency? Well, it's a lot of numbers. If you see it there, uh, you're, you're uh, fooling yourself because actually the latency happened way before that. How about now? Do you see a latency? Better? I zoomed in. I do here. I do here, here, here. And the biggest one right there. And look, this is on an idle machine. The kernels do it. Basically, nothing's going on. No tasks are running, just cyclic tests. That's the only thing. All those little events are cyclic tests running. A little work use here and there, but nothing is running at all in that big gap there. And I have function tracing running. Look at the delta, 249 microsecond latency. Sked deadline. The folks in Italy uh, who developed the Sked deadline scheduler, if, uh, earliest deadline first, it was one of my first talks here at, the, uh, at in Kernel Recipes. I talked about schedule, Sked deadline a couple of days ago. Uh, they used Kernel Shark to uh, debug their work. So, Back in Pisa, uh, the university there, they, um, when they did the development of SCED deadline inside the Linux kernel, the earliest deadline for a scheduler, they used in their papers and in their PhDs, Kernel Shark was actually quite popular with them. So now, why to go to version 1.0, the Qt version? What's, what's the difference? 1.0 is much faster. Like I said, we had fun coming up with algorithms. Uh, I'm not going to take the credit, uh, the, the author of this, uh, the guy that I got hired, he came up with an algorithm uh, that I have to give kudos to because my algorithm was linear. Uh, what I would do was, okay, I got a bunch of data, say I have, a, say I have one billion events, and then I have a, I'm drawing the pixel, say a thousand pixels. 
So I say, okay, the first event is in the first pixel. Great, let's find where the next pixel what I should draw. So I draw that first line for the first event, and then I search, you know, 999,999 more events until I find the next one and say, hey, here's the next event to draw a new pixel. And then I look at another. So I'm looking at a million events at every single pixel to draw something. So that's not that great. So what uh, Jordan came up with was a binary search. So he actually puts it into a special database, the events, and we get the first pixel, and then he does a binary search to find where the next pixel is. Then a binary search for, now, you think about it, you're, going, you're using the whole data set to find the next pixel. But with, say if you had a million entries, um, so if you look at the algorithm that there, um, it's each, uh, where n, n is the number of events, m is the number of pixels, uh, the, it's O n divided by m is late for each pixel. So if you have a, that's a one million queries. Now with a binary search, which is O, which is log two n of the number of events at every single pixel, not, you know, then you can multiply it by, the, you know, m is almost a k, you're doing 10, um, 30 queries per, so it went from one million uh, queries into the database or into the data to 30 per pixel. Quite a drastic measurement. So, uh, Jordan, I, I always butcher his last name. I don't, I'm almost afraid to say it. <laughs> Jordan, yes, if you're watching this, you can uh, criticize me. On, uh, not, I'm not going to say your name. <laughs> but there it is up there. Um, he's the main writer. He's rewritten it. I basically review his code. I still maintain it. Uh, my goal and my hope is that Jordan will become the maintainer of uh, Colonel Shark and I could go off and work on other things. So that's my goal. I want new blood in the world. So hopefully Jordan will take over. So you'll see his name. He'll, he'll be presenting, by the way, here's a call out for everyone here. He is going to be presenting Colonel Shark 1.0 officially at the Open Source Summit in um, Edinburgh next month. That's why it has to be done by next month. <laughs> This is what we call conference-driven development. <laughs> so it was completely written from scratch, literally. We basically threw away all um, the Kernel Shark old code and did it from scratch. Now, Kernel Shark uses a lot of trace command code, so that part is obviously the same. So everything it actually does with reading the, the trace data and all that, that is that's a separate library, uh, and then that, he didn't have to touch that. In fact, we worked together to make sure it worked. But he created a new layer that was specific for like a kernel shark engine, and I'll be talking more about that later. And like I said, he would, I just, when, I first, when he first came out, I said, here, here's what the old kernel shark does. Come up with anything, just play. I let him play for months before he had to do any patches. I said, just write code, try to imitate this in Q, do whatever you want, and I just let him play. And then eventually we visited, and then once he came back, you know, when you play, you're not going to write the best code because you're just doing uh, experiments. So I just let him experiment, and he did came up with some fantastic ideas. Now we're trying to productionize it. So we had to rewrite a lot of code, hence why we're so late. But it's a new, new look, new design, and it will be becoming a library. More on that later. And again, much stress how fast it is. So. This is what the old version looked like. The new version's a little fancier. Look at the headers. The old one, um, by the way, I have to question, how many people actually played with Kernel Shark here? Got a few people, okay, cool. So when you move the mouse along, um, every time you hover over uh, an event, that yellow square box shows up so it moves along whether you want it there or not. It sometimes could be annoying, sometimes it's great, but it shows you the information that you want. Jordan got rid of that. Uh, that was a bit of a discussion. <laughs> I liked it, but after a while he convinced me that it's, it's annoying. Um, and I, I have to agree with him, it is. So he, puts a, he put all the information in the header. So when you go there, up on the top header where we have uh, the pointer stuff, uh, he put, so all that information that's in my yellow box is now in just in one spot, so you can move it across, so you can see, just look one place and see where it is. Makes much more sense. I think that's, uh, it, it is uh, a better um, algorithm, more professional. <clears throat> so we have markers. Uh, the one thing that I love about markers, you saw how in that 250 microsecond, I wanted to be able to measure between events, uh, different things. So um, in kernel, in uh, <clears throat> The 1.020, I have a marker A. So what you do is anytime you do a left mouse click anywhere on an event, 
it's going to mark it. And up on the top corner, you can't, I don't know if you can really see it, but the green uh, number thing, that marker A up there on the top um, left corner there, you'll see, I think, do I have a mouse here? Can you see it? Ah, you do have a mouse. Yeah, right up there. Yeah. Okay, so that's where you can see where the mouse is. Um, that's where you click, so it gives you the timestamp of the event that you clicked on. The cursor is a double click. If you double click everything, the cursor goes, you'll see this, and what's the difference between marker A? The cursor is where the graph is, and we have this little thing, graph follows. So if you click on any of the, uh, the text here, which is the normal like trace command output, it will show you where it is online here. If you double click down here, it will move the cursor. So that's where the cursor is, is basically here. We have a pointer, which is just where your mouse is over the mouse. That, this pointer up here will move or we'll update the timestamp by your mouse. So now we have a cursor and marker A. Marker B is where you do a shift left click, or double, I don't know if, yeah, shift left click, I think it is. Gives you a marker B. This is how you do the, and when you do a marker A, marker B, it automatically gives you the delta between the two. So that's how I can see the delta between those. The new version. One thing you'll notice, the pointer's up here out of the main row. Uh, that still exists where your mouse is. It'll give you where the point is. But you notice there's no cursor. Um, we had a discussion on that. We found out that the cursor is redundant. Let's just not have a cursor. So we got rid of that. Marker A is just a double click. It's not, a left click doesn't do anything, but a double click will put your marker A there. So you see marker A there. Marker B, you don't do this shift click again. You go up here, you click on marker B, now anything you go is marking marker B. It's the same double click. So they're both the same. So marker A, marker B is a double click, and just you pick what here, there you have. Same thing with the delta, that all works good. To zoom, uh, what I would do is I would, in Kernel Shark 1.0, you press, drag the mouse, let go. That hasn't really changed, but uh, this is what you press, and then you'll see the second line show up, and then you let go, and then it will zoom in. The new way, you click, you select, you get a nice little sh shadow to see what you're zooming in, the same effect. Selecting of tasks, you'll see that when you have a task, if you want to plot tasks, you don't just have to plot CPUs, by the way, I'll go back again, just to let you know, each color is a, uh, uh, each color in there is a different uh, task for the CPU. So each color is a different task. If you notice something, here, I'm gonna show you something here. In my old way, you'll notice that they're all solid lines and in the new way, they have these kind of a flunk, funky uh, color, like it looks like a shift something there. That means there's more than one event. And when there's like multiple events, it kind of gets weird. So you can actually know that's like kind of like more than, or more than one task, not more than one event. I meant more than one task is in that pixel. It kind of gets kind of weird, because I think the last pixel story showed, so that's why it does that. Which is kind of good, more information. Uh, but if you want to plot tasks, um, it's done slightly different between the two. For those from that did it the old way, you actually had to, you select and then just arrow down, it'll automatically select each one. For the new way, you have to drag and drop, select them all, then hit enter, and then they'll all select. Um, so let's say you want to measure wake-up latency of a task. So both of them do this. You see this little green box here? Uh, there's a little green box here that you, or that's empty here. Both. Kernel sharks have this. And this is one of the things I do. When you plot a task, um, this is where the event that the task was woken, this is the task where it was scheduled in. So this is actually the wake-up event, which is somewhere up here. Someone called it, I don't know who, but it's down here, I know it's a wake-up event. And then I click here, and to, but to, to measure it, you have to be kind of, you can't be precise, it's hard to be precise, because you have to double click, or you click, and then you shift, click, and if you're not quite on the event, the time up here is not always exactly the same, because you're, you may not be perfect in where you click. It's kind of, it's sometimes hard when you especially have a high um, resolution uh, machine to get that right pixel to click on. It's not the best thing. The new one, it, you can only select an event. You can't click on something that's not an event. You can put your pointer over to see what the time is, but when you double click, it will find the closest event and select that event that, within a range. So uh, his is actually on the event and it's on this event. Um, See the little dot here, the little dot, and the little dot right there? Well, that actually shows you the event, where the event exists on the line. In the old way, that didn't exist. So you had to actually kind of guess which 
if you have a bunch of CPUs or a bunch of tasks and you click someplace and you look at the event down here, you don't know exactly, you know, it's kind of hard to figure out which line that event is. You actually have to go down here and look at the CPU that it's on or what task it's on and then find it on here. Whereas the new way, you just there. Also, if you notice, we have one selection and that's the cursor, not marker A, marker B, that's the cursor where you did your double click, that's where it selects. It doesn't really match up with this or this. But you notice here, there's two lines selected, two different colors. That's A, that's B. So now you actually, not only do you find the event on the screen that you see up here, where it's easy to see where it was, a little dot, a little dot, if you can know how great the resolution is here, but you also see the events that you selected down here. One thing that is probably one of my, one of the things that's been on my to-do list for Colonel Shark for almost eight years, I just never got around to doing it. I started working on it, but I never got around to it. It's one of my most biggest pet peeves for anyone that's used Colonel Shark. You go and you do something and then you exit out and then you want to get back to the same position you were when the next time you're in, you got to actually go and do all the things. You got to search for, sometimes I would record what, what the, um, record something here to say, okay, I'll search for that event and be able to see it again. Well, Yordan added automatically using JSON files that every time you close your thing, it saves where you closed it. It matches the file, matches the clay, saves everything about it. So you could go up here and say, restore last session, and it'll actually bring up the last session and bring you right where you were, where you left off, which I'm like ecstatic of Hoover. That's something I've been wanting for so long, just never got around to doing it, and boom, he did it while he, without even me asking him, because I think he had the same frustrations too. Zooming, I already talked about Zooming, but last yesterday, or two days ago, no, yesterday, I decided to do record the pain. So, old Colonel Shark Zooming. So I have here full events, there's 63, million events in this file. Um, this is the full view. When you open up, that's the full view. I want to zoom in. So I zoomed in. I go here, select it over, and then let go. And you could whistle the Jeopardy theme song. Oh, it came up. Beautiful. Now I can adjust it. And then go around, uh, yep. The new zooming, go up, you select, let go, boom, it's there. Uh, there's, notice there's no bar, we kind of move it that way, back and forth, and since it's so quick, Jordan decided why don't we just take the mouse wheel, and when you move the mouse, you zoom in and out. So you could zoom really quickly, you could get exactly where you're just a little mouse wheel, and zoom some more. So if you notice that uh, there's no, um, let's see if I get my mouse here, there's no uh, bar down here that the other one had. Uh, the reason, and if you want to do left and right, you do it here and here. Actually, I'm glad he did that because he was one of the problems with uh, doing graphical user interfaces and we have so much data, you really don't, to have that bar there, you kind of have to represent how far out, like the whole window the, where the bar is going to go. So when you have a bar that you scroll back and forth, you really have to have information to the data thing, what's in the screen when it scrolls. You could play tricks and stuff, but it's kind of difficult. So instead of um, playing with the scroll bar logic of Qt and all that, which I was doing with GTK and I had to do all sorts of tricks and it was horrible, messy code. We do the left and right, so when basically he only, uh, basically uh, re renders, not really re renders, but he only looks at the database in that window, so he doesn't have to look at all the data outside it. He has not just a window, but a little bit outside the buffer, so as you scroll or go to your left, it's pulling in the next data, so it's got a buffer, so it can do it just as quick as the scroll bar. So it doesn't have to measure, so that makes it really nice, that's quick. So what's next? So, right next, after all this is done, we plan on coming up with libcapeshark.so, which basically take the guts of everything that we've done and make it modulized. So, the kernel shark that you saw, what we just demonstrated right now, is going to be a shell. We don't want, everything that we do, we just want that application to be some sort of shell and all the guts, all the visualization, everything else is going to be in a library that any application will do. We're going to put it under, um, uh, LGPL license, so whoever wants to use it can use it. 
Uh, if you modify it, you have to give it back to us, but you could use it for almost anything. Uh, it will also allow recording into the trace. It has, there's, we also have full recording windows. I didn't demonstrate that. I think Yarda might be demonstrating that, uh, how you can actually kick off uh, recording, because the new kernel shark will actually pop up a window. You can type in your root password, boom, it'll switch to root level, and then uh, kick off any recording, and it, you actually have a lot of, you know, instead of having to know all things about ftrace and what's available on your kernel, it will actually analyze it and say, oh, this is what's available and give you nice menus on what you want to select, what type of tracing you want to do. And you could also save those sessions. So if you want to say, hey, every time I want to record here, click a button, load a session, and it kicks off that record. So there's a lot of possibilities. Um, we're going to be using uh, a Python hook. We want so Python applications will be able to have access to this. Um, what plugins, we have, we have all these plugins too that we'll be able to do in C, C++, and Python, you'll be able to actually modify, have, we already have one plugin that came from someone, I think it was uh, not the Zenomai folks, yeah, I think it was Zenomai folks, or, or some people are working with Zenomai, they wanted the Zenomai guest to become the schedule switch event. So when they got those events with wake ups and things, it was all with the Zenomai events, so they, over, they used a plugin to override all that. So the way we have this, we're gonna have a Libs K Shark engine that does all this. Remember I told you, he rewritten and made his own engine. And it's going to be able to read trace.dat data, it'll perf data, and common trace format data. So we're going to be able to read all this, um, any format. So once, once the common trace format data, once you do that, that's the uh, Linux trace toolkit uh, uses that. So anyone familiar with that, it does everything in tr uh, common trace format. So uh, ideally, I don't want to be a competitor to like trace compass and all this. I'm trying to make this so we're kind of playing for our own, we have our own agenda for getting all this. But we also want to make it so anything we come up with, anyone can incorporate by just pulling in the library if they want to. And we'll be working with them. I'll be at the Tracing Summit and we'll be presenting this, trying to get collaboration. Um, so basically you could have like a web browser like attached to Apache that has full access to all this if you want to do, do a plugin for Apache, a Python script. So I took this analogy from like GCC. How GCC has basically the engine and you could take C, C++, Fortran, Ada, whatever, and it compiles into its own little kind of binary format, and then you run it into GCC, and then from the engine, and then you could, from there, it's a single engine that could do x86, ARM, PowerPC. Um, what else was coming up? Well, right now we have, we want different views. We want to be able to visualize things differently. So right now the plot view, which is what you saw, and then there's uh, graphs. So basically we could take the data, so for example, if I just retrace all the read events, um, and I want to see uh, how big the read was, so how, how much was read, how many bytes were read at each event. I want uh, a graph, make a graph out of that. The timeline will still be the same, like you know, the x-axis will be the time, and the y-axis will be how big, how much was read, so you can actually see spikes in reading. So we want to be able to add that information. Uh, flame graphs, uh, Brandon Gregg gave a nice uh, talk last year on uh, flame graphs. We want to incorporate that. Um, Ideally, it comes down to this, is we want also, we're working on this, this is going to be coming up probably in a 2.0, is we're going to be tracing or be able to visualize between multiple guests. So you can be able to see events from the guests to the host, synchronize, we have it working on synchronizing timestamps and such, so that you could see how, say, an interrupt comes into the host, how it goes to the guest, how the guest, uh, where's the latency comes in. So we get uh, see the flow between events between that. Hence why VMware is allowing me to work on this. Because eventually we even want to kind of do this with the cloud. So, I think I still have time, so we have questions or a demo. I'm gonna do a demo real quick. Oh, well, let me do, yes, yeah, so I got like five minutes. Oh, and I started late, or we started late, so I actually have more than five minutes. <laughs> so real quick kind of demo, just before I do that. So, I wanted to kick off the old, this is on the trace data that I used, and I'm gonna kick off kernel shark 0.2, the old one, and now we can go. You're late. There we go. <laughs> Um, and the funniest part is, okay, I'm not going to do this whole, I'm not going to kill you on this. I got to go through it all again, now I resized it. <laughs> kill it.
Let's go to the new one. It's in a K Sharp Q. Currently, if you download it, actually on my repo, I do actually post this, and Jordan has this link too. But we're not putting it officially, it's not officially released. Now, it still has to load all the data, so it still takes a bit on the first initial load. So I can still go the but it shows you progress, which is a huge improvement. Because <laughs> there's times where like, you're wondering, especially if you get a big failure, like, did the machine just lock up on me? And you're down there, boom, it's still much quicker. And once it's in the database, pow. Pow, zoom in, zoom out. Ah. So, and then I can do plots, tasks, this is why, There's the tasks. I can zoom in here. Uh, yeah. I'm, so, I'm so used to using the mouse, so I usually, I forgot you had to go down here to get the scroll bar. That's one thing I have to get used to. Uh, let's see here, so got marker A already selected, so I just go here and double click. Got that, go up, click on marker B. Hello, day click, there it goes. It's a little lag there. Jordan, do you see that? There's a little lag there. Click, boom, you see the, uh, the events there, the delta, that was 88 microseconds wake-ups. So, welcome to Kernel Shark 1.0, almost released. Thank you. Well, first, questions. <laughs> yep. Uh, my question was, uh, in FIO, the storage uh, benchmarking tool from uh, GenXBO, we have uh, some rendering issue. I was wondering if we could have a meaning to put their trust inside Kernel Shark, because we have jobs. And jobs are generating graphs like latencies, like bandwidth. And maybe um, we can see it over time. Here's the thing we tell people. This is the same thing like Jan Kiska is the one that was working on Zem and I that talked to us about could I use this. Either you could write your, we want the plugins to be easiest enough. Ideally, we'll just give you um, information on how to write the Python plugin or whatever and you could just write something and get whatever you want. Otherwise, give me the requirements that you want and we'll write a plugin or something. We'll, we'll make it into a plugin. To any modifications like that will be a plugin that you could just kind of have in your own local tool set or we could develop it so you could plug it in and you could make it change. You could show you latencies. Yes, we're gonna have things that will analyze stuff to tell you where, where latencies are is maybe show it on the graph. We're working on, we got, I got a new person that's here too that also is good at visualizations. So we're looking at other ways of visualizing like latencies and stuff like that. So this is all very, very new. We're just trying to get one. Oh, by the way, just to let you know what the requirement for 1.0 is, is to get everything that the original GTK has done solid and uh, with good quality. That's 1.0 is that. But from then on, for 2.0 or 1.1, 1.2, we're looking for plugins. So yes, uh, send me an email. Um, you, know, you know it. Sure, thanks. Uh, you had a question? Um, you started out by saying that um, the hardware manufacturer had a 250 microsecond delay. Yes. Did you manage to make him fix it? Basically, they forgot that they had a SMI kicking off that was doing an um, ECC cleanup. Uh, so, yeah, they were like, oh, yeah, we found it. <laughs> yes, they went back and they fixed it and went down to uh, 15, 10 or 15 microsecond delay after they fixed that, yes. And even those little wide ones, it was, it was just what happened was it was doing two. It did two. Like, I saw that it was weird because I could see the delays of like 50 micros uh, microseconds or 50 or 80 microseconds or something, and then they would slowly get bigger, and then as they got closer together, boom, there was one big one. <laughs> it was weird on what their algorithm was. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, could we have a look at what your input file uh, looks like, please? The input file is a binary file. Oh, ah, okay. But, um, it's trace.dat file. It's the trace.dat, the trace if you notice it was a trace.dat file. So I could do a trace command on that same file I just did. Oops, oh, I have to do report. And there, this is all the data. And this is like it says there's six million events. Uh, but if you do, let's see if I have it on this file. Yeah, you can do man trace.dat. It tells you how it's written up. So, uh, by the way, I, um, I had this one a long time ago. This person uh, sent me an email asking me, by the way, can you tell me what the binary format of trace.dat is? And I said, yes, download my code, install it, and do man trace command dash dat. And he goes, oh, thank you. 
a, a month later, I get CC'd on patches to the crash utility. Everyone, anyone knows what the crash utility is? It's uh, like a GDB plugin by Red Hat that you could look at core dumps of kernels and analyze the core dump. Well, he had a trace, there's a trace plugin to that that you could actually kick off function tracing, the machine crashes, does a core dump, and then go in and say X trace dump, and it'll create a trace.dat file for you, and the trace command can read it. As if you had did a trace to extract right at that point. Okay, thank you. In fact, it was giving me some ideas for load balancing environments. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Well then, thank you very much. I have one last question for you. I've been working really, really hard on speaking slower. Was I better? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you.